it covered the ground as far as the eye could see. It looked like snow, but it wasn't snow. The Bible describes it as bread that came down from heaven. And interestingly enough, the Bible says it was angels' food. It was like a wafer with the taste of honey. And Scripture says it was like pastry cooked in oil. The children of Israel called it manna. You know what the word manna means? It means, what is this? God had brought this manna down from heaven to feed his people, the children of Israel, while they wondered in the wilderness between Egypt and Canaan. There was nothing there to eat, so God supplied it. But they'd never seen anything like it. And so they asked, what is it? The true answer is, it was that which was given by God to sustain them. But I want to emphasize this morning the question they ask. What is this? Now, when I ask what is this, I'm hopefully going to give some meaning to something. What is this? When we gather together as the church... We need to keep asking ourselves, what is this? Why are we here? What are we doing? What is the meaning of this? And when I ask, what is the meaning? I'm not thinking of the little boy who went to a certain congregation regularly and one Sunday he invited one of his friends to go with him, and the friend never had been to church before. And so when the singing began, the little visitor leaned over to his friend and said, what does that mean? And the little boy explained what the singing was. And when the prayer came, he said, what does that mean? And his friend explained that to him. During the Lord's Supper and the giving, he asked, what does this mean? And he explained that. And when the preacher got up to preach, he took a large pocket watch out of his pocket and put it on the speaker's stand, and the little visitor said, what does that mean? And his friend said, it doesn't mean anything at all. Now, I'm not thinking about that. When I ask, what is this? I'm not talking about the length of the time we spend together. But I am talking about something that is really significant and really is important. I want to begin by stating three facts. Number one, there is in the world something that we call cause and effect. We think of it, directly or indirectly, and honor it every day. There is cause, and there's effect. Now, the second thing is, when there is cause and effect, there are always byproducts. And when there is cause and effect and byproducts, there is some purpose for it all. 
Now, let me illustrate it this way. Suppose that a low-pressure natural phenomenon occurs so that down across the, the central plains of the United States, this low cell moves. And up from the gulf, there comes moisture and warmth. And those two things meet in North Texas. And four inches of snow fall. You see, the cause is the way the weather's working. The effect is four inches of snow. But then, in addition to the cause and effect, there are byproducts of all of that. The byproducts include things like snowballs, slippery roads, snowmen, and tire chains. The byproducts are the result of the cause and the effect. And then there's purpose. There's purpose in all of that because the snow comes and the earth receives the moisture that it so much needs. Now, Eric, do you understand what I've just said? Cause and effect, byproducts, and a purpose. You got it? Then everybody else will get it too. Sorry. Now, just set that aside for a moment. And I want you to notice with me, when we come together as we have today, there are certain questions that need to be asked. In order to demonstrate what I have in mind, I want to go all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As the crowning climax of his creation, he made a man. And the Bible is careful to tell us that man is made in the image of God. Now, there's something significant about that, don't you think? Man is made in the image of God. That is, there's something about man that is so like God that we are said to be made in his image. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean in the physical image of God because God is a spirit. He doesn't have a physical body like we do. But there's something about us that is like God. What is that? And I want to suggest it is that we are persons. We are persons who think That's our intellect. Who feel, that's our emotions. And who act, that's our willpower. And intellect, emotion, and willpower separates us from the other things that God created. And we are like God in our personhood. Why did he do that? Why did he make us as he did? I may not know fully, but I can give a reason. God created us in such a way that we can have a relationship with Him, and it is a relationship of love and obedience. And He made us capable of responding in that way through intellect, emotion, and willpower. So here is man in the image of God with purpose that God had in mind. The problem of man is that he did not love God and did not obey God, and therefore his relationship with God was interrupted. However, God set in motion a plan 
to redeem man from his sin. Now, why is that story told in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis? It's there to tell us what the rest of the Bible is about. The rest of the Bible, after the creation and the fall of man, is God's plan to redeem him. So early, God said in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman, would give victory over evil to the man. And then God's plan began to unfold throughout the rest of the Bible. So in the New Testament, we learn in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, Galatians 4 and verse 4. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, as the Son of God, came into the world to redeem us. He lived, he taught, he performed miracles to demonstrate who he was, and finally he died on a Roman cross between two thieves. But his death was greatly significant because he died for our sins. He was buried, and then he rose from the dead. He went back to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. There is the creation and the fall of man, his need of redemption, and God's plan to redeem us. Here's a question we need to ask. If that's true, what must I do to be saved? Did you know that that question is in one way or another, is asked three times in the book of Acts. The book of Acts in the New Testament is God's answer to what man is to be so that he can be redeemed. And we learn in reading those accounts that if one has never understood or never believed who Jesus is, he needs to believe. And if he has believed, he needs to repent of his sins. And what that means in few words is that he changes his mind. He knows he's going in the wrong direction. He wants to turn around and go in another direction. And his motivation for wanting to repent is that God, is good, and we have not given to him what we should have. And so the Bible calls that godly sorrow, which works repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 tells us that. And in the book of Acts, if one has believed the gospel and repented of his sins, and he's interested in what must I do, he's told to arise and be baptized to wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now that is important information. If we believe in the creation and fall of man, and if we believe that Jesus is the Redeemer of the world, it tells us how we can respond to Christ and be redeemed. There's another question we need to ask. What do I become? When I respond to God in just that way, what will I become? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 says, If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. God gives us a new lease on life. Now, one is a new creature when he's in Christ. He isn't a new creature when he's out there separated from Christ. But when he responds to the gospel, as people did in the book of Acts, he enters into Christ and he's a new creature. Now, let's see if we can bring all that together. Let's return to how we began. In the beginning, we talked about cause and effect. 
in our spiritual lives in salvation, there is a cause, and that is the love of God. Why, why did God do all that he did to bring us to redemption? It's God so loved the world. So the cause is the love of God, and the effect is what we became in Christ. We became something new. Now, in that cause and effect, God's love and our obedience in becoming new, certain byproducts. You see, as a result of our being redeemed from sin, as we enter into Christ, we become a part of that which the New Testament calls the church, the body of Christ. And it seems to me that we ought to be interested in what church is about. If, in fact, the church is the outgrowth of the love of God and the fact that we can be redeemed, shouldn't we want to know about it? And where are we going to learn? Well, we'll need to learn by going back to the original, back to how, what God said about the beginning and the growth of the early church. Now, here are some things that I know about the church. Number one, I know how it was organized. You know, if you're going to have a group of people meeting and working together, There's going to be some kind of organization. What was it in the New Testament church? And it really is pretty simple. Philippians 1 and verse 1 summarizes church organization. The letter of Philippians was written to the saints, that's the Christians, the saints at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. That's it. That's all there was to the organizational framework of the New Testament church. I was saying in my class this morning, there was no statewide, there was no nationwide or worldwide organization. Each congregation was self-ruling under Christ, and when that congregation was fully developed, it had elders and deacons. Bishops in Philippians chapter 1 refers to the work of overseeing. But those people who met certain qualifications and who were appointed as elders were also the bishops, older in the faith and overseers. There's a third word that describes these people. They were older in the faith, they oversaw the work of the church, and they were shepherds. And like shepherds, lead and feed and protect their flocks, so elders, bishops, or shepherds look after the church of God. That's a a simple organization, and yet it's something I need to know. When we come to a place like this and we call ourselves the church of the Lord, how are we going to be organized in that way? In exactly that way. That's the way this church is organized. A second thing I know, as a byproduct of the love of God and our salvation, as being a part of the church, is how it was designated. You got to call it something. What are we going to call it? In the New Testament, sometimes it was just called the church. You know why? because it was the only one there was then. So it's just referred to as the church. But in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, it is called the church of God. That's appropriate, isn't it? Since God originated it, since it came out of the mind and heart of God, it is of God. In Romans 16, in verse 16, various congregations of the Lord's church are called the churches of Christ. That's appropriate too, inasmuch as Christ bought it with his blood. It belongs to him. 
It is of Christ. What we've been saying for a long time is, when we designate the church, why not call it something that the New Testament calls it? Now, I also know how people worshipped in the New Testament church. Their meetings were very simple. They came together like we have today, and they sang like we have today. They prayed like we have today. They studied the word of the Lord. They took of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, breaking the bread and drinking the cup in memory of Christ, and they gave of their means. It's what we want to do when we come together. Why? What does this mean? It means that we're trying to be the church of the New Testament. Number four, I know how people became members. Number five, I know what the doctrine of the church was. And it's found in the New Testament. The first century church never followed the traditions and doctrines of men, but what God had said. And God has preserved that for us in the New Testament, and that's what our doctrine is to be. And number six, I also know what its work was. Its work was the proclamation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to the end that people might be saved. What is this? It has a cause, the love of God. It has an effect, what we become in Christ as the redeemed. There are byproducts to who we are, and that's as the church, how we're organized, what we call it, how we worship, how people become members. We identify it. We can identify it from the pages of the New Testament. What's it going to do in the world? What's it going to become? What are we going to teach? What's our doctrine going to be? Those issues always must be answered by what God says. There is cause and effect, and there is something It is called the byproduct. But remember that there is also a purpose. And what I want to ask today is what is the purpose of our being together as the church? And I want to give two answers to that. The first one is that we in the church are seeking to become more and more like Jesus Christ. That's God's goal for us, and that's our goal for ourselves. We know that we're imperfect. We do not think we're better than others. We do understand our imperfections, but our goal is to be like Him. And that's God's goal, too, for us. Romans 8.29 says that we are to be conformed into the image of his son. And then the other side of that is we are to bring glory to God. In Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, the apostle Paul said that God is to be glorified in the church throughout all ages, world without end. When people look at God's plan of redemption, 
and the reality of the church. And the question is asked, what is this? What does this mean? What is the purpose? Shouldn't we want to give a biblical answer to that question? In the Old Testament, Moses camped with the nation of Israel after it came out of Egyptian bondage at Mount Sinai for about a year. And during that year, God gave to Israel through Moses the law of Moses, the heart of which were the Ten Commandments. He gave to Moses a pattern for the tabernacle, the tent of meeting where God said, I'm going to meet. He also gave to Israel through Moses an elaborate priesthood and sacrificial system. And after about a year, they were ready to to set out from Mount Sinai on their way to the land of Canaan, and Moses' father-in-law was with him. But Moses' father-in-law was from that area. That's where he lived. And Moses said to his father-in-law, Come with us. Come with us to that land. Come with us, he said, and we will do you good. I want to say today, we believe we know who we are and what we're about. And our message is, come with us we will do you good. We'd like for you to come with us. If we didn't know any more than what we know here today, we know enough to start. What about stepping out for Christ and saying, I want to simply be a New Testament Christian. I want to respond in obedience to the gospel, to the love of God. I want to be a part of the church that we read about in the New Testament. Come with us. We will do you good. Your-